Jason, welcome to the podcast again. Hey, thanks, Casey. It's great to be back. Oh, I'm excited to have you here. Last time you were on, it was right in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, and there was a lot of fear, a lot of panic. I think you were able to bring a lot of sense into the conversation, talking about future trends and just what's going on. And so I truly appreciate that. Today, I'm hoping we get into something just a little bit different. I'm hoping that we get into re retirement and real estate, how these two things integrate. We get so many questions about real estate from the families we work with, and we have have the best resource in the world. We've got Jason Hartman here with us. Yeah, well, thank thank you so much. And um, it, it's you know you said in the middle of the pandemic, I would uh, I would argue that we are only in the third <laughs> inning even now. But you know uh, when we talked before, that was a few months ago. But in pandemic time, it's like dog years, right? And so right. so much has happened since then. The world is changing so quickly. Uh, so I, I think our talk today, also Casey, per per your suggestion, uh, will be a little more perennial too. Uh, you know, of course, we can we can lean on some of the stuff that's happening. That's obviously just massive changes to the world. Uh, but uh, you know, th this this will apply years from now. It, it'll it won't change very much. Uh, you know, in terms of the uh, the uh, technique used, I, I think the technique will will very much be the same. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I've seen real estate in our family be used for generation after generation, much the same way as previous generations. And so I, I don't see the strategy changing a whole lot. That's what I'm hoping that we can really focus in on here on our conversation. And so I'm just going to start with the easiest question. You know, where does real estate fit in to a comprehensive retirement strategy? Oh, it it is it is the strategy, if you ask me. I mean, listen, I'm a fan, so <laughs> you know, maybe maybe I'm not, I'm I'm not the most impartial person to ask, but I love income property. I think it's the most historically proven asset class in the entire world. I don't think there's anything better. Uh, it's certainly not perfect, but uh, like I, th I think it was Winston Churchill said about democracy, it's not perfect. It's just better than everything else. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, there, most there of the go. families that that we meet with, you know, they the wealthiest of families that we meet with, you know, on average, their largest assets throughout their lifetime have been real estate. Uh, that's how my parents created their wealth, and I'm on the same track. You know, my largest assets tend to be real estate and insurance and business assets. Right. Um, um, and so there's definitely something there. And people often ask, and just on a side note, people say, well, what's the best inflation hedge? Should I buy gold? I say, no, buy real estate. You know, right. Historically, real estate's been the best inflation hedge. So there's a lot of places that real estate could fit. It could fit as a piece of growth. It could be that's really helping you keep up with inflation. It could be passive income that's supplementing your social security or pension. Uh, what do you, how, how do you think of it? You know, when we think of our process and our framework, we have liquidity liquidity, income, growth, estate, uh, and tax planning. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, good, good question. And, um, you know, uh, I certainly own a variety of asset classes outside of income property. And I really like to try, although I have to keep correcting myself, I, I really want to distinguish um, real estate, in quotes, from income property, okay? Because we're really all about income producing real estate, very specifically. And, you know, my definition of an investment, Casey, is that an investment is something that produces income. If it doesn't produce income, it doesn't qualify as an investment in my book. It is purely a speculation or really a gamble. Now, I don't mean to say that you can't make money gambling and speculating. I certainly have, and many other people have, but many other people have also lost a lot of money, and, and so have I, <laughs> gambling and speculating. Uh, you know, so if you're a high net worth person and you want to take 10, 15%, maybe even 20% of your net worth and do some speculating and, and gambling, you know, you can afford to lose that money. So it's, it's not a big deal. And you might hit a home run. Um, but what we're really about and what my company is about uh, is impact empowering investors. And as we talk about the empowered investor, the empowered investor is someone who focuses on income producing assets. They focus on yield, they focus on cash flow. And you know, uh, yield and cash flow are pretty reliable when it comes to income property. So we'll, we'll kind of dig into that. And also uh, some, some massive changes 
in trends and how people look at housing and renting versus owning and uh, all of that kind of stuff, I think will be very interesting to your listeners and viewers. Also, I'll share my screen and we'll have some charts and graphs and, and visual aids. Uh, but I know some of your people are, are only listening via audio. So we'll try and describe those as, as well. Yeah. Well, you know, I think there's two big things that most of the families we work with, you know, as they transition into retirement, they shift their focus from growth at all costs. And now they say, hey, I have enough. Now, how do I protect it and create an income? You know, it's about risk management and income production. And that seems to fit very well when it comes to real estate. And yeah. so then we, you know, it begs that question, how do we protect our downside risk? Because I have seen many people lose a lot of money in real estate state. It's yeah. not that everything turns to gold. There are real risks there. Anytime there, there's, there's, there's real returns, one there's formula. Risks. There's basically one formula for losing money with your real estate. And we'll talk about that. So <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that. That's a good one. Yeah, no, that, that is a key here because once you get to this point in your life, I mean, one, you want time freedom. You don't want to be thinking about managing these real estates. I, I want to talk about how we make make this a very minimal time commitment right. for the individual that's investing. But probably more important than that is how do we protect our downside? Does that have to do with not just income versus growth? I hear you saying, well, focus on income. That's less risky. But there's a lot of different ways we could focus on income. It could be a short-term rental, a long-term rental. It could be commercial. It could be residential. What, what are your thoughts on risk? Uh, you know what? It's, it's, if you look at what has gone on uh, in the world the last... 15 years, uh, and then the last several months, it has really proven what I have been teaching people for 17 years. And that is that the home is the center of the universe. And just simple uh, income producing properties, bread and butter type properties, basic income properties, are what people always need. They have universal need. Uh, you know, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right, and it doesn't say it exactly this way, but the take we can get from that is that every human has three common needs, food, clothing, and shelter, okay? And let them rent that shelter from you. Uh, that's what I say. So these income-producing properties in, uh, you know, in the, in the right markets, in the right areas, following my 10 commandments of successful investing, they just work. They work year in, they work year out, they've worked for decades, they will work for decades to come. It's the most historically proven asset class mm -hmm. in the entire world. And so, uh, so we're talking those, single family homes, single family homes, basic single family homes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, you know, in middle, middle and lower middle class areas, not the bottom of the barrel, uh, not the high end, not vacation rentals, um, you know, vacation rentals. Uh, there are a, a few opportunities there that kind of make sense. Uh, but given uh, what's gone on lately with COVID, uh, you know, there are a lot of people that have been very, very hurt because mm -hmm. what they were really doing was buying a speculative asset class that was propped up by a booming travel industry and a booming economy. And that changed radically overnight. And people still needed a place to live. Okay. They still needed yeah. basic housing. And that is a need that will just never, ever go away. Uh, so uh, I've become pretty conservative as the years have gone by. And uh, I just like basic rental housing. That, mm -hmm. That's that's where it's at. And so maybe I'll, I'll share my screen and, and show you uh, an interesting visual that I think- I want to we'll see that, Jason. Be, yeah. and, and as you transition over there, I want to say that sounds so boring. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what's that? <laughs> but safety is boring, right? I, yeah, we, for, yeah. for me- you know, we, I love our vacation rental. So we've got a vacation rental, Northern Michigan, and through COVID, our rents have went through the roof. I, oh, I really? think it's, That's interesting. I yeah. think it's the location though. It's easy access from Chicago and Detroit. People are trying to get out of the city and they're flocking to the upper peninsula of Michigan where they can be you know, secluded. And it's worked really well. And we love it because we get to go up there a couple months a year and use it and enjoy the property. And um, when I think of, and I've thought about doing these single family homes and two things come to mind. One, uh, 
that just doesn't sound like very much fun. I don't get to use it. I don't get to enjoy it. And number two, it sounds like I'm going to be dealing with runners and headaches and fixing things. I, I don't know how you overcome those two attributes. Yeah, well, that's what we do. Uh, we, we basically help people make that simple. That's what my business has been for the last 16 plus years is, is helping people, uh, you know, make a, a really simple task of direct investment in income properties. So uh, that, that's our entire business. So no, no problem talking about that. Um, okay, so let me see, let me try this screen share again here and uh, see if I can do it a little bit better. Um, just one second here. Um, okay, all right, I think this will work better. Okay. Now, right. you, sh you should be able to see, do you see- For those of you that are there? listening to the podcast right now, as Jason's getting into this, if you're just listening to the podcast, you, should, you could be seeing these visuals if you followed our YouTube page or our Facebook page. Yeah, so, um, so here we go. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a graph that shows renter households in the past 13 years and then projected uh, for the next 15 years by age. And what's fascinating about this, something that's really never happened before in history, is that the renter population is aging dramatically. Okay. And th this is this is quite fascinating. So let's start back in 2007. We're dividing these, uh, these renter populations into three demographic cohorts, uh, people 34 and under, people 35 to 59, and then people 60 and over. And what this shows you is that uh, the dramatic expansion in the renter population is age 60 and over. And mm -hmm. this is really something that has never, never happened before in history. So um, these renters are getting older. There's really no stigma to being a renter anymore. There used to be. It used to be kind of people looked down their nose at renters and thought, oh, yeah. well, you're not a homeowner, right? But people have realized that, number one, if you're renting a higher-end property, that's actually a very good deal for the tenant, okay? Um, you know, it's it's the ultimate arbitrage. It's, it's a great deal. Uh, but number two, uh, you know, it really gives people a lot more flexibility and a lot more opportunity. Uh, Newsweek magazine published a very big cover story several years ago. Uh, and this was the first time that people really rethought uh, the way this, this concept works. They, they did a huge study that found that uh, areas and neighborhoods with the highest home ownership rates actually had higher unemployment rates. And if you think about that, it's, and I hear I'm not talking about the 60 and over age, so I'm kind of jumping around here. Um, but if you think about that, it really makes sense because as I've said for many years, the best thing anybody can have on a resume is mobility. Being able to move to where the jobs are, that's the best thing you can have on your resume, right? Mm. And when you're a homeowner, it actually restricts you. It bogs you down. It weighs you down. It limits your flexibility. Uh, whereas if you're a renter, you can just give notice to your landlord and you can move to where there's a better opportunity. And America is a very mobile population. So, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with renting. I think it's a great, great thing. Now, um, what I really recommend for people watching and listening are, you know, most, most of your viewers and listeners are probably homeowners. And, you know, that's fine. Uh, there's certainly some psychological benefit to being a homeowner. I'm a homeowner. I've mostly been a homeowner uh, throughout my life. Uh, but it, sometimes I've been a renter. And um, renting a high-end property for yourself and owning a lot of low-end properties that you rent to other people is a fantastic deal. That is the best double arbitrage ever. Now the word arbitrage, you know, most people understand that word. It basically means exploiting the differences in things. That's what arbitrage is in my simplistic definition. If you want to hear my simplistic definition of derivatives, uh, it is the thing about the thing, 
<laughs> so I like these very simplistic definitions of things because we don't get lost in the weeds. Uh, so um, so uh, it's, it's a double arbitrage where you exploit the differences in things from two sides. You rent the high-end home for yourself or you get the advantage as the tenant of a fantastic rent to value ratio. Then you rent lots of low end homes to other people and you get the advantage as the landlord, as the investor of a very good rent to value ratio that's favorable to you, the landlord, okay? So uh, I just thought this was kind of interesting because what it shows is that our rental populations are becoming much more stable and you know, most people think older people are more responsible than younger people. That's just known. Look at insurance rates for car insurance, if you don't believe me. And uh, we all know that's true. Uh, so uh, this renter population is becoming easier and easier to manage. Okay. Uh, and, and that's one of the great things too, that maybe nobody's really talking too much about. So now let's talk a little bit about retirement strategy overall. This chart was just interesting, and I just wanted to share it with you, okay? Any questions on it before we leave it? I do have a question. Uh, I, I'm wondering, do, do you have any statistics on this? You know, are these individuals that are transitioning into retirement, are they using this strategy where they say, you know what, I, I want more flexibility, I want more opportunity to move around, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and rent. So they sell their yeah. home and they become renters. Are you seeing that people are selling their home and becoming renters, or are these individuals that are in this age Age group 16 over, they've always been renters. They're just entering that age group. Oh, yeah. Good question. That's a very good distinction. Most people wouldn't see that distinction. Well, the answer is I don't have any exact stats on that for you. But what I will tell you anecdotally is that um, we, have, we have definitely seen a very high percentage of baby boomers uh, that have become empty nesters, meaning the kids have moved out. Uh, and frankly, they don't want the kids to come back. You know, the millennial generation is known as the boomerang generation. You know, you throw a boomerang and what does it do? It comes back to you. <laughs> and, and so they want to get rid of that big house and downsize and, uh, and, and be able to have the freedom to travel and not have a lot of home maintenance and things like that. So um, uh, they are renting. Uh, they're, they're, former homeowners that have just decided to rent by choice in many, many cases. Okay. Well, I wonder what your thoughts on, on this piece are. You know, I, I've seen some of the research showing that it's actually cheaper to rent. Uh, I've seen it the other way too. It depends on well, who does the study. It, is it, it well, cheaper to it, rent or is it cheaper to own? You, you, you can't answer that question with a, a blanket statement. You have to know the price of the home, okay? Because it's, it's much cheaper to rent a million dollar home than it is to own it, okay? Because the rent to value ratio is favorable for the tenant, okay, mm -hmm. on an expensive home. But it's, it's much cheaper and better to own a $100,000 home uh, because the rent to value ratio is in favor of the landlord on the less expensive house. Okay. Yeah. So, so it, it depends on the, the value of the property to answer that question. Okay. There's, of this demographic, one of their go goals is also just to focus on what's most important, right? For right. a lot of the families we've worked with, you know, they've, a lot of them have managed their own money for years, yep. you know, decades. They've managed their own stock portfolio and they say, you know what? I don't really want to do this anymore. Yep. I don't mind paying a little extra cost to have you do it for me here handle yep. this. And sure. when it comes to owning a home, there's a lot of time commitment that's involved right. and you'd rather rent. And maybe if it, even if it costs a little bit more to rent, you free up your time. There's yep. a price to time. And for many retirees, it's worth it. Right. There's a lot of hidden costs to home ownership. Uh, no question about it. So again, the strategy being, you know, whatever you do with your own home is obviously your decision. It's a partially emotional decision, psychological decision, not just uh, a money decision. But definitely, definitely, the renter population is increasing dramatically, okay? And um, the demographics coming at the rental housing market over the next 10 years are nothing short of phenomenal. So it is a very, very desirable time to be a landlord. Now, let me uh, uh, talk to you about one of our strategies um, which is called refi till you die, okay? So I want to get into that because it is a very good uh, strategy. It's the most tax efficient way to extract the wealth from a real estate portfolio. And uh, it's, it's really just a great 
great strategy. So we'll get yeah. into that in a moment. And Jason, for, let yeah. me interject. Yeah. Uh, I've went through these on your website. I have had so much fun clicking through the different properties and seeing your projections. Right. Um, and if you want to go and figure out how you should be analyzing a property, jasonhartman.com, pretty cool resource. Yeah, thank you for that, by the way, because we've got a free video. It's just 27 minutes long uh, on the website, on the front page of jasonhartman.com. And that will go through every single number on this performa that every people who are watching can see on the screen right now and um, uh, basically help people understand how to be a good investor. It's the shortest investing course on the planet. It's 27 minutes. And if you learn how to read a performa and standardize your data, you will be a very good investor. There are other things to know, certainly, but I tell you, this is the foundational thing right here. Standardize your data and learn how to read and analyze these numbers on this performa. Mm -hmm. it, it's very hard to make a mistake if you if you just watch that video and, mm -hmm. and learn from it. So so that's there available. Um, this is interesting too, by the way. Um, higher home ownership rates translated into faster household formation. Okay. Now the interesting thing here, the comment from the Wall Street Journal is again the data is a bit suspect, but this is from the uh, the Federal Reserve. Okay. Uh, and you got to believe everything the Federal Reserve says, right? <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic. But, you know, it's just interesting here to see um, the the household formation component, okay? And can this you is, explain what that means exactly? Well, what this means is, um, uh, you know, when people move out of usually their parents' house and form a household of their own, that's how household formation, Okay. Most of the time, these are couples, not as much as before, though. You know, uh, marriage has kind of gone out of style a bit, for better or worse. I think it's probably for the worse, uh, societally speaking. Uh, but um, but it, it's what we're seeing. So we're seeing, uh, you know, as we see the millennials grow up, uh, you know, the oldest millennial now is 40 years old. Okay, so they're no longer like these kids. Okay, now we've got Gen Z coming mm -hmm. after them. The millennials are known as Gen Y. And so we've got a few demographic cohorts to think about. Okay, we've got um, the matures. Okay, they're older than the baby boomers. Then we've got the baby boomers, who was the biggest demographic cohort in history uh, until the millennials came along and beat them just by a little bit. Baby boomers are about 76 million Americans. Um, and then we've got Gen X, my generation, that's a very small, lonely generation. There's only about 46 million of us. Then we've got the millennial generation that's actually the largest. Um, mm -hmm. And that's about 80 million, okay? And now they're forming their households. They're finally getting around. They've really delayed household formation. They've delayed marriage. They've delayed kids. Uh, all of that stuff. And they're, they're still delaying it, but, you know, it's starting to finally happen now. Okay. And so that's influencing this. And then we've got Gen Z coming after the millennial generation. And, you know, we don't know that much about Generation Z yet. So, uh, you know, the jury's still out on uh, how they're going to act, how they're going to spend, what their political beliefs will be. We, we pretty much know what the millennials are like. Uh, so it's an interesting thing here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what do now, we glean from that, that um, the millennials delayed, and now they're starting to own homes, now they're starting to own... Or, or rent homes, they're just forming households, that's all that chart. Okay, it's not it necessarily home ownership. home ownership. Yeah, not necessarily home ownership, it's, 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 it, it does influence the home ownership rate, because a lot of them do buy homes. But, you know, basically the point here is, millennials are growing up, okay, and they are finally getting around to things like marriage and kids and, you mm. know, household formation. They're not living at their parents' house as much anymore. Okay. Yeah. So, so demand you know, is going yeah. to be increasing quickly. Demand increases. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Okay. So uh, here is the refi till you die strategy. Okay. And, um, you know, I have uh, my core content is called the 10 commandments of successful investing. And um, one of the things that people ask when they learn about this content. And, you know, you can hear more about that on my podcast and so forth. Okay. The Creating Wealth Show uh, is, is they ask, you know, Jason, your strategy really uh, recommends using leverage and using what you call, and I'm, I'm speaking from their point, what I call inflation induced debt destruction, which is basically the hidden wealth creator of income property. 
uh, showing how inflation essentially pays our mortgages off for us. And one of the reasons I do like income property debt very much, I, I jokingly say it's my favorite four letter word, is because, um, you know, with as income property investors, we don't pay our own debts. We outsource that obligation to people called tenants. Our tenants pay our debts. And so uh, that, that creates what we call self-liquidating debt, self-liquidating debt, because the tenant pays the debt. Mm -hmm. And it's similar to in the world of uh, corporate raiders and Wall Street bigwigs. Uh, they use a strategy called an LBO, or a leveraged buyout. And I'm sure, of course, you've heard of that, and probably most of your listeners have. And so when you hear about uh, Carl Icahn and the late T. Boone Pickens and, you know, all of these big Wall Street bigwigs, right, they, they use the LBO or leveraged buyout strategy, which basically involves uh, acquiring a company with a lot of debt and then having the income from the company pay off the debt for you. It's a fantastic strategy. It doesn't always work because businesses are much more volatile than in, volatile than income properties. But with income properties, they're they're pretty um, stable and secure. Uh, so the tenant pays the debt off for us, and that's a that's a, just a beautiful thing. We outsource that obligation to the tenant. But inflation also repays that debt. And maybe in the future we can do another episode where I really dive in to the inflation-induced debt destruction strategy. Mm -hmm. um, but now let's talk about refi till you die, okay? So let's start with an example here. Now, this is a very simplified example. Um, and it basically includes uh, people buying uh, a $1 million portfolio. So this might be 10 uh, little $100,000 houses in three diverse markets around the country. Uh, maybe they buy, uh, you know, three properties in Atlanta and then uh, three properties in uh, Indianapolis and, and three in Memphis or something like that. You know, we've got many markets around the country that we help people buy properties in. They put 20% down. And uh, of course, all this is subject to qualifying and so forth. So it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a back of the napkin example, okay, uh, which is $200,000. Uh, they have about three and a half percent, give or take, in closing costs. That's about another thirty-five thousand dollars, and then they need cash reserves for vacancies, maintenance problems, things like that. Of about forty thousand dollars is the minimum we recommend. They could have a little more, but they should have at least four percent of the value of the portfolio. Okay, so that's forty thousand dollars. So they need about two hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars to execute this strategy and own a $1 million proper, uh, portfolio of maybe eight or 10 properties. So as uh, Jerry Maguire said, show me the money, right? We all remember the movie. Well, how do you extract the wealth out of your portfolio? What is the best, most tax efficient way, the lowest risk way, and uh, the way to give you the highest return on investment? So here we go. We started with a $1 million portfolio. And uh, we had a $235,000 investment. Remember, we have $40,000 in reserves. We're not going to count that because that's not part of the investment. That's just on the sidelines. $800,000 in loans, $200,000 in equity. That's what it looks like when we start. Mm -hmm. Now, if we take the approximate historical appreciation rate for real estate around the U.S., it's about 6%. You know, people will vary in their estimates a little bit, but most people will settle somewhere around 6%. Okay. So by the rule of 72s, uh, at 6% appreciation, we will double our portfolio value every 12 years. Okay. So we see a doubling every 12 years at 6%. Now I want to point out that income property is a multi-dimensional asset class. Mm which is a wonderful thing because we earn our return in many ways. Uh, most people think there are five ways. I really think there are maybe seven ways. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful asset class. The one we're talking about here is only one of those multidimensional ways that we earn return on investment from. It's simply appreciation, nothing else, okay? So uh, everything we talk about here it's better in real life, okay? So this is just a very simplified example for 
you know, time and simplicity. So we wait 12 years. Say we're 40 years old when we start this strategy. And now we are 52 years young. 52 is the new 30, okay? Uh, so uh, what has happened in that 12 years? Well, our portfolio doubled in value. It went from $1 million to $2 million. We have a $1 million gain. And now we go to the bank and we say, bank, I want to do a cash out refinance of my portfolio. I'd like to borrow 80% of the value of the portfolio. So the bank will say, okay, we'll give you $1.6 million in loans against your $2 million portfolio. And that means our equity has now doubled from $200,000 to $400,000. And we have $800,000 in cash. Now, if we're incredibly dumb and we don't do anything with that cash except stick it under our mattress, which of course we would never do, okay? But for simplicity, let's assume we do nothing. We know nothing about investing. We're terrible investors. We just hold it in cash. And we simply divide it by 12 and withdraw one twelfth of it every year for the next 12 years, okay? Let's do one more cycle here. So now we, uh, we go, uh, we let uh, 12 more years go by, okay? We're now, uh, how old are we now? We're 64 years young. 64 is the new 40, okay? And our portfolio has doubled in value again. It went from 1 million originally to 2 million to now $4 million portfolio. We've got a gain of $3 million. Remember, we're not including the fact that we've hopefully had some good positive cash flow all these years. We've had uh, good tax benefits all these years. Income property is the most tax favored asset class in America. Um, we're not counting any of that. We're just doing a super simplistic example here. We go to the bank, we say, bank, I would like to refinance the portfolio for 80% loan to value. And so the bank says, okay, we'll give you $3.2 million in loans. That means our equity is now doubled again. We went from $200,000 to $400,000 to $800,000 in equity. So our equity position keeps getting bigger. And we have proceeds of $1.6 million. So if we are terrible investors, we don't know anything about investing, we simply bought these properties, let them appreciate and refinance them every 12 years. We take our $1.6 million, we stuff it under the mattress and we withdraw one twelfth of it every year to live on. Mm. Now remember, there's no tax on borrowed money. So this is tax-free money because there's no tax on borrowed money. So that $133,000, when you divide by 12, the money you're getting 0% return on, and of course, you're not going to do this. You're going to invest it uh, you know, with your company, and you're going to make a nice return on investment, or you're going to go buy more properties, and those are going to start working for you. But say you did none of that, okay? <laughs> so... Uh, you know, depending on your tax rate and your tax bracket, you know, this $133,000 is probably worth about $200,000 taxable, right? It's somewhere in that ballpark. So we have $133,000 a year tax-free income to live on. Okay, let's do it one more time. Now the portfolio has doubled again. It went from $4 million to $8 million. We now have a gain of $7 million, okay? We go to the bank, we say, let's refinance 80% LTV or loan to value. The bank says, okay, we'll give you $6.4 million in loans on your portfolio. That means our equity doubles again. We now have $1.6 million in equity. We have $3.2 million in cash, cash out in tax-free cash, because there's no tax on borrowed money. If we divide that by 12, we have a quarter million dollars a year $250,000 a year approximately in tax-free income that we just divide by 12 for the next 12 years. This is a super simplified example. There's much more to it than this. It's better. It should be better than this in real life, but it's just an example of the best way to extract the wealth from your portfolio. Now, a lot of people will say, well, Jason, 
if you keep levering your portfolio up like that, won't your mortgage payment increase? Well, yes, maybe. I mean, depends on the interest rates at the time, right? But rents, at least historically, have always increased. There's no example of rents not increasing over time, okay? Every example is, yes, they increase. They increase to cover that increased leverage and those increased mortgage payments. Uh, also, you know, you may not be doing this every 12 years. Of course, you're going to judge the mortgage climate, the interest rate climate. Uh, and we've helped many clients do this over the years. This is just an example to simplify well, you have, it. We need to you've do got it. 12 years to decide what you're going to do. Yeah. yeah. Right. I, I, I think my main takeaway here is, as is quite often some of my biggest takeaways with meeting with families time and time again, is there's a lot of ways to make money. Right. And there's a lot of different ways to invest your dollars to make you more money. And I'd also say another good takeaway here is that you're having people refinance in their mid 60s, their 70s, their 80s. And that's quite contrary to what many people believe yeah. that I shouldn't have debt in retirement. You're showing yeah. us how to have debt. And, but, and I argued, do you have debt if you have the cash to pay it off? Yeah. I, good I'm question. not sure. Good, good thoughts. You really have it. Yeah. Okay. Remember, this is self liquidating debt. Okay. Look, I personally don't have any debt other than mortgage debt. And I have a car lease. Okay. I, I do think leasing the car is a better deal than owning it. So I do lease my cars. Not always, but most of the time. So, you know, the, the BMW payment is a lease payment. I guess you could call that debt, but you know, my business pays for the, the lease anyway. Uh, but um, I, I don't like debt unless someone else pays it for me. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of debt I like. So the idea of paying off your mortgage is a really bad idea. You know, uh, the financial advisor, Rick Edelman, he's been on my show a few times over the years, mm -hmm. and he has a, uh, a video you can find on YouTube. It's called 10 Great Reasons to Carry a Big Long Mortgage and Never Pay It Off. Now, he didn't really even touch on all the reasons. There are more than 10. Mm -hmm. You know, he just gives you 10. Uh, but uh, really, this, this mortgage debt when you can get th three decade long fixed rate debt at you know, negative interest rates, frankly, they're negative interest rates, you're getting paid to borrow the money. And if we do another episode on the future, I'll go through my whole inflation induced debt destruction strategy. And I think that'll really, really be very valuable to your listeners and viewers. Um, but you, know, you, you don't wanna pay off good debt, you wanna pay off bad debt. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, going into retirement, this is the best kind of debt to have. It's fantastic. It works for you. I like it. I had this conversation with a member of the Ramsey Solutions Group. Oh, uh, they're, and, they're lost. Yeah, they well, don't get it. Yeah. And they were in agreement. They're just talking to the masses, right? Yeah. The, the masses don't have the discipline to use a strategy yeah. like this. I, I think yeah. there's many irresponsible people with their finances and debt You're can right. be a very dangerous thing. But you know, I said, why would I ever pay off my mortgage if I've got it over here you right. know, at 3% and I'm making 6% I safely? Know. It's, it's, there's listen, no reason for me to ever pay it off. And I don't even think I have debt if I can pay it off in any given time. Uh, I invited Dave Ramsey onto my show. He didn't come. He sent his number two guy, okay, or his, or his you know, main guy, uh, Chris, second to him. I don't remember his name. Anyway, he came on the show. He had all kinds of, you know, false assumptions about mortgage debt. He said that, well, they can call the loans due. No, they can't. That they haven't been able to do that since the Great Depression, okay? That's been, that hasn't happened in almost 100 years, okay? They can't call them due early, okay? They, you have, they have to honor the mortgage contract. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's just a lot of misleading info that, uh, that Dave puts out. But look, at, I, do, I do want to commend Dave on one thing. Dave Ramsey is fantastic for the, the lower middle uh, of the economic strata. People with a bunch of credit card debt and car mm -hmm. loans. I mean, his show starts off saying, you know, where we replace the BMW in the driveway with, you know, the uh, junkie car that's paid off or whatever he says, you know, mm -hmm. that's true. Those people need paid that message mortgage. that yeah. they need that message. Okay. He's right for those people. Mm -hmm. The problem is you've got to graduate from Dave Ramsey. If you're moving up the mm -hmm. socioeconomic ladder, Th this idea of paying off properties, it it's a terrible idea. It's an outmoded idea. Listen, before 1971, when we were on the gold standard, before Nixon closed the gold window in that historic meeting, when he said we would temporarily, what a lie that was. Okay. Um, you know, uh, 
make uh, make make the uh, dollar not convertible to gold, right? And you know we all know the history of Bretton Woods and so forth, right? But uh, the the game plan then it it did make sense to pay off your debts. Now it doesn't. Okay, when you have good quality fixed rate, incredibly cheap debt, you should keep it. It's an asset. It, you don't want to pay it off. It's a crazy, yeah. it's an outmoded idea. It, it hasn't been true since 1971. Jason, thank you so much for coming on. I, 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 we got, as always, you know, we schedule these meetings for about a half an hour and I yeah. feel like, well, I want to go for three or four We hours. could talk forever. Because I know. There's so much <laughs> stuff here and I love these concepts. I love your ideas. I love your visuals, your yeah, creativity, you. you know, what you're providing. I think it's just amazing. This is stuff that people want to know and it is a small percentage of Americans that actually get this knowledge. And right. Sadly enough, I think it's usually just passed down from generation to generation. You know, I inherited these kind of thoughts from my dad yeah, and I'm passing do. them on to my yeah. kids. Right. But now we're living in this world of information and podcasts. So I hope we get this out to as many people as possible because this is a way to truly grow wealth and also create a pretty fantastic supplement to your retirement income as well. So Jason, yeah. I thank you so much. I, I hope that we can do this again in the future. Yeah, my pleasure. And there's a lot more detail on these concepts on my Creating Wealth podcast. So, you know, anybody can find that on iTunes or all the podcast platforms. Just type Jason Hartman, you'll find it. And, uh, and that, that video on the front page of my website really, really helps people understand investing and how to analyze a good deal versus a bad deal uh, really well. And it's totally free at, at jasonhartman.com. Okay. Well, we will have so, a link to yep. that and the tools and the resources, you know, the transcript from our discussion. Everything's going to be at retirewithpurpose.com. Check out the podcast page there. Good stuff. Good talking to you, Casey. Happy investing to you and all your viewers and listeners. Thanks, Jason. Until next time.